May I please request that everyone take their seats. Um, this panel, the, the speakers for this panel are Mr. Ravi Ratna Sabapati, Resident Fellow of the Advocate Institute, Suresh Shah, Director, Carson Cumberbatch, PLC, Thilan Vijay Singha, Chairman of the National Agency for PPP, Sri Lanka, and Dr. Malati Knight, Consultant, Verite Research. This panel will be moderated by Dr. Nishanti Mel, Executive Director, Verite Research. And now, to deliver the keynote remarks, I would invite uh, Ravi Ratna Sabapati. Thank you. Uh, when we started this exercise uh, two years ago, it was supposed to be a very simple one-off exercise. Uh, we were just going to collect the information on state enterprises, like a lot of government data. It was scattered all over the place. Uh, all we were going to do was to collate it, tabulate it, and get a snapshot of how large the footprint was. Uh, when we started trying to get into the data, uh, we realized that we'd been sucked down a great big black hole. Uh, the only data that was available was for 55 of the strategically important uh, enterprises that uh, were being monitored by the Department of Public Enterprises. Uh, there were references to 264 uh, enterprises at that time, uh, but nobody seemed to know what they were or uh, nobody had a list of these and uh, no one seemed to know uh, who was really monitoring them. Uh, two years hence, uh, we have references to 400 enterprises, uh, and we do actually have a list uh, of the 400 uh, enterprises. Uh, the only thing was when we tried to reconcile this list with the gazette notifications which allocate the enterprises and entities under the various ministries, uh, we ended up with a count of 527. Uh, so we now have a list of 400, but we are not quite sure whether uh, there are more that can uh, that should be included. So there's an ongoing process of trying to reconcile these lists and to find out just how many of these things that we've got. Uh, now the question is, if you don't even know how many you've got, right, how are you supposed to be actually trying to monitor them, right? Now this is the central problem uh, uh, that we call the problem of agency. Uh, when you have a company or a business in which shareholders have invested their money, uh, they employ directors and managers to run it. Uh, the shareholders are the owners, uh, they've put their money in, uh, but they don't have the time, so uh, they have to hire uh, management to run the business. Now, uh, the management is supposed to run it for the benefit of those shareholders, but of course, uh, the, the management, the agents, uh, have a certain advantage, uh, they have greater knowledge, they are close to the ground, they are, they are the people who control the resources, and now their incentive is to try to maximize their own welfare and not the welfare of the shareholder, who is the owner. So now uh, the shareholder of course has an incentive to monitor them, but uh, to assist this process we have the company law, uh, which sets out certain uh, rights of shareholders, the, the duties of directors, uh, limits on certain uh, types of uh, actions that uh, may be uh, carried out. Uh, there's also codes of corporate governance which fill in any gaps within the company law. So that's how uh, 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 shareholders in private companies try to uh, ensure that uh, their agents, the, uh, the directors and the management do what is best for the shareholder. In the case of state enterprises, we have a small complication uh, because state enterprises are supposedly owned by all the citizens or run for the benefit of the citizens. We still have managers and directors who, uh, who run those or administer those enterprises, but the shareholder or the citizen doesn't really have a say in, uh, in appointing them or, in, or has any means to control them. The control of uh, the state enterprise management is rests in the hands of politicians, right? Now the politicians, unlike shareholders in private companies who've invested their own money, have not invested any money. The money that has come in from the public and got invested, but the politician is supposed to control them, but has no particular incentive to do so. Now, Sri Lanka's political system has some peculiarities. Uh, to begin with, uh, we have a feudal 
patronage-based system of politics. Uh, politicians believe that in order to be elected, you need to give jobs, right? Uh, so uh, once elected, they look for opportunities to stuff as many people into the public sector as possible. Now, the Treasury and the Ministry of Finance tries to impose various restrictions on uh, recruitment to the public sector. Uh, state enterprises tend to be, especially if they happen to be limited companies, uh, tend to have more leeway in hiring people. So uh, you find a situation of uh, this chronic overstaffing that takes place in many state enterprises. So uh, that's one problem. The second problem is the problem of campaign finance. Uh, it takes anything from 50 to 150 million to get an MP into office. Now, these MPs uh, earn a salary of 54,000 rupees a month, right? There's no way that they can repay those campaign costs out of their lawful earnings. Uh, so they come into office with a need to recover all their campaign sp uh, spending. So uh, what do they turn to? Uh, corruption becomes an incentive. Now, if they are hoping to campaign for the next election, not only do they have to re recover the cost of the last election, they've got to find money for the next election as well. So you've got uh, an incentive for corruption that's inbuilt into the political system, right? So first, you, uh, they have an incentive to, uh, uh, to try and recruit as many people, uh, and, uh, and, uh, which ends up with problems of overstaffing. Second is they have an incentive to corruption. Now, uh, this, uh, these two incentives operate in a political system where you have a parliament that is weak uh, because of crossovers and, um, uh, and uh, it's like a rubber stamp majority. It doesn't really hold the executive to check. Uh, you have committees that are also weak. Uh, uh, so uh, they don't function as effectively as they could. So uh, what happens is the, uh, you've got politicians with uh, perverse incentives. You've got a system that uh, uh, finds it rather difficult to hold them in check. And so the combination of distorted incentives and weak accountability uh, is a recipe for disaster. So uh, the staff at uh, Advocata uh, spent a lot of time trawling through the uh, COPE reports, uh, which are very painful to read. Uh, uh, they spent some time uh, uh, digging through the Auditor General's report, and they've summarized a set of some, uh, a sample. There's this, this, these go into pages and pages, but a sample of uh, some of the reports. And when you see what the, those reports say, um, uh, you, uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, things to get worried about. For example, why did the Sri Lanka Ports Authority spend 5.8 billion rupees constructing a cricket stadium in Surya Baba? Now, what does the uh, Ports Authority have to do with a, uh, with a cricket stadium, right? Uh, perhaps there was a minister who happened to be a cricketer, but, uh, uh, but uh, uh, and it was done not with a contract, it was done with a variation order, right? A variation order is, uh, is something that happens within a uh, project uh, when there are small changes to the specification, but how you can, uh, uh, a port can, uh, give a variation order to construct a cricket stadium, I cannot imagine. The State Pharmaceuticals Corporation has bought about a billion rupees worth of substandard pharmaceuticals uh, between 2011 and 2014. 867 million of this was for distribution through the free health system. Uh, they also mentioned that imported pharmaceuticals not properly tested due to lack of laboratory facilitator facilities Drugs later found to be substandard are issued to patients owing to the delays in testing samples prior to the distribution. Uh, the Lanka Satosa, which is supposedly uh, a state-owned supermarket, uh, has managed to lose 15 billion rupees in the import of rice. Uh, according to the Auditor General's report, they failed to maintain proper stock records, uh, lack of a uh, proper computerized system, uh, they can't track 7,947 metric tons of rice, which have apparently been lost. Uh, uh, the chairman has said they were unable to provide the Auditor General with 
information on monthly sales because the majority of the shops are not con connected to a computer system. So this is like uh, the dog ate my homework kind of excuses that you see uh, coming out. Uh, government procurement guidelines require that formal contracts are required for any purchase of goods or service exceeding 500,000 rupees. Uh, uh, Satosa managed to buy 2 billion rupees worth of rice without a single contract. Uh, there's many others that the report lists out, but there's one particular one which I uh, put in there, although the numbers are not very significant. Uh, the budget of 2015 proposed a monthly payment of 2,000 rupees for elders over the age of 70. Uh, the Ministry of Social Empowerment and Welfare, the relevant line ministry by way of circular number one of 2016, has ordered that 100 rupees be de deducted from each payment and the money be retained at the Secretariat to set up a welfare fund. Now, uh, when you look through uh, some of the uh, reports of that Secretariat, they had 10,978 elders registered. Uh, if you just look at uh, 100 rupees a month uh, for those 10,000 elders, it works out to about a million rupees going into the welfare fund of the ministry every month. So that's a fairly decent amount of money that you can use to buy bath packets and arak bottles for your election rallies and do various things with it. Now, to the credit of the staff of the uh, ministry, they have actually uh, opposed this. Uh, and the finance ministry, it was in violation of finance ministry um, uh, directives also. So when finally finance ministry did find out, uh, they did stop it. But I think the message is that if they are willing to steal 100 rupees from a 2,000 rupee payment to elders, I think uh, the message is that there is no sum of money that is too small to steal, right? So if you've come to that stage, I think only the gods can save this country. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ravi. I'd now like to invite our distinguished panel to take to the stage. Just check whether all our mics are working and whether the mics there are working as well. <coughs> so let me thank Advocata for inviting all of us to follow up on Ravi's um, excellent, uh, I think, presentation and also a very interesting report. I don't know how many of you all have had the opportunity to pick up this report that's available outside and I think distributed freely, uh, in which the analysis is not only about research and numbers, but also I think it gives a conceptual framework and a thought framework with regard to thinking about the SOEs. Uh, and I want to congratulate Ravi and the Advocata team uh, for doing some great work uh, and setting up for us a very important question and a problem, right? Uh, we know, and this report helps us know better, uh, and certainly presents uh, important evidence to suggest that public ownership of enterprises is a problem. Okay, uh, I think I think that we don't need to dwell a, a lot on the details of the problem. But Ravi, you feel free to elucidate them in other ways, because it's in the report. I want this panel to try and take us a step further and ask, well, if the public sector ownership is a problem, wherein lies the solution? So maybe I should give Ravi sort of the first step in helping us frame that way forward. Uh, Ravi, given that you've done all this research uh, and given thought to it, uh, how do you approach the the new problem of thinking about a solution. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, now this was the biggest problem. What is the solution? So uh, now there is so much in company law 
that we actually take for granted, and even the codes of corporate governance are fairly well ingrained, right? Now, when you look at these things, uh, you know, these are so far off the chart that you can't even think how to navigate back to, uh, back to some kind of uh, 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 you know, position where you can start. So I think the, uh, the, we've started with some very simple recommendations uh, to start with uh, uh, basically to restore some basic control and accountability mechanisms uh, so that we can bring some sanity to these proceedings. Uh, uh, so that at least the state gets, uh, uh, you, uh, we propose that you do a census of all these entities, set up basic reporting structures and basic control processes that, uh, uh, that at least you get regular information monthly on how they are performing. Once you get that, then perhaps you can take the next step of seeing how to, uh, how to deal with it. Uh, uh, we've also proposed certain things to strengthen governance uh, as, as a next step, but uh, I would say initially try to bring this uh, situation under control. You need to bring control to the, uh, to the problem, I think, uh, before you can talk about uh, reform. Super. Uh, let me flip that same question back to Suresh. Uh, Suresh, in terms of bringing control, so I'm going to keep this sort of where I am really reacting to some of the things you're saying, and I might interrupt you in the middle and ask you questions. Uh, why can't we simply say, well, I'll have the same rules for public-owned companies as we have for the publicly listed private companies? We know that when you're listed in the stock market, there are high, uh, high levels of regulation and especially uh, significant requirements about disclosure. Uh, that Ravi is asking for, control. So Ravi's documents really says the problem is that the, public's, the public, who's the owner, has no access to management, very much like a listed company. Uh, why can't the listed company structure, or Suresh, what do you think about that? Can the, can the same disclosure rules that we put around listed companies, if we were implementing them for the state-owned enterprises, become the kind of solution? And Ravi, feel free to react to what Suresh says. Um, so, let me start uh, with the question you actually asked Ravi, what the real solution is. Sure. And I want to go back to what Ravi said. You know, you have a situation where someone's actually willing to skim 100 bucks off a payment to a 70-year-old, right? When, when that's your playground, uh, I don't think controls is the, is the long-term solution. To me, I don't think government has any business being in business. So I think the long-term solution to the problem, uh, the challenge that we have with the SOEs, is to privatize the lot. Um, uh, I am generalizing a little bit, but I mean, I think yes, privatize a lot. However, you can't do this from day one. I mean, you can't do it one shot. You've got to do it by, in stages. Uh, and in that process, so let's, let's say it takes X number of years, and that's where your question then comes in. Uh, yes, I do believe very strongly and I have made the suggestion and the recommendation that SOEs should follow the listing rules. Uh, for example, when it comes to disclosure, quarterly accounts, annual accounts, and they need to come out by a particular day, exactly like with a public listed company. Uh, Remcoms, even non-coms, and there are ways in which that can be done. So yes, the not, list- Not Remcoms. Sorry? Not Remcoms. Uh, Remcom, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, so get the whole system, if, if a public listed company can follow the rules of the, of the stock exchange, uh, there is no reason why a SOE shouldn't do the same because, you know, at the end of the day, it's far more public and SOE is far more public than any public listed company. So the short answer is Is yes. there anyone in this panel who disagrees or has a different take on, on what Suresh is now advocating? Uh, and even Ravi as to whether this public listing uh, can be at least a first step towards, uh, towards a solution. Tilan, do you want to say anything on that? Yeah. Um, I have a different point of view because... Well, if I you can, don't... Uh, if, uh, but if I'll you give you a solution as well. Okay, okay. Right, well, go my, ahead. My view is that listing per se is, not, is probably a sufficient condition but, but not a necessary condition because I can, I can cite Sri Lanka Telecom as an example, 
where certainly with due respect to the private sector minority owners, governance standards are appalling at Sri Lanka Telecom. Um, uh, we didn't, I didn't quite follow that. You're saying I'm saying telecom, that listing, listing alone is, is not yeah, going to be the telecom, answer. But in telecom, you're saying governance standards are now bad or good? It, 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 it is quite bad, in my view. Right now? In my view, Now, yes. in Advocata yesterday, everybody was highlighting telecom deregulation because, as a great because success. Because I read in your report that it's 2,000 2, uh, or more uh, excess staff is, is in Sri Lanka Telecom. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I, I also question the right of the government to appoint a chairman into a company that is, that is privately managed. Uh, I question uh, potential weaknesses in the, in the privatization agreement which might have to be revisited in order to provide full autonomy. Now, I was actually the chairman of the committee that selected the financial advisors when Sri Lanka Telecom was privatized during my days as chairman BOI. But I believe that there are fundamental flaws in the privatization agreement that we have the sort of governance structure at the board level that we have at the present moment. But my, my solution, Ravi, which I, I happen to glance through your report and I commend Advocata and, and, and all those who are involved in this, in this in preparation of this report. In one word, what I feel is what's required is enforcement and empowerment. Sri Lanka has adequate laws, in my view. I don't think we need another piece of legislation on how to control these SOEs. We have the bribery acts, we have uh, anti-corruption provisions, we have the uh, uh, government procurement guidelines, etc., etc. However, what is lacking is enforcement. There's sufficient teeth in the Finance Act for the Finance Ministry to control these SOEs, at least for them to be better governed or better managed. And I do not, I, my, one of the key solutions that I see to the problem is as I, just as much as enforcement is important, is the empowerment of the finance ministry, which is the eventual beneficial owner of all these state enterprises. And I have not seen yet a finance ministry that is assertive enough to take control of the rank mismanagement that is going on in many SOEs in order that the finance ministry gets an adequate return on uh, the, the, the investments that have been made on behalf of the people, as you rightly said. Uh, so, so to me, a key part of the solution has to be enforcement and em empowerment. Okay, but uh, you know, that's like saying I'd like state-owned enterprises to be better managed and Ravi is saying, look, you know, you're never going to get them to be better managed. You're just moving that whole problem one step back and say, well, we'd like enforcement. So let me, let me ask uh, that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, happy, I'm not disagreeing no, with you. I'm, I'm just I'm challenging happy, you to. I'm you raise that because I, I, I agree with Suresh. The easiest thing, I mean, it's, 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 it's fantastic to say let's sell everything. But let's be realistic, Suresh. Right? I, again, during the Chandrika Bandaranaga government, where I, I, which I was a part of, uh, we privatized 13 enterprises steel, telecom, gas, etc. Duty-free. I, I didn't know why the government had to uh, own a duty-free operation. But in reality, you're not going to see, I, I don't think in my lifetime, the privatization or unbundling of, tele, uh, on unbundling of electricity. Um, I'm not sure whether I, we will see the divestiture of the terminals that are owned by the Sri Lanka so Port Authority. In, in the interim, while we wait for sort of other types of solutions, uh, listing alone is not the solution. It can be a part of a solution, but we can move to a, a enforce we, better management. Yeah, because, because yeah. The, as you said, Ravi, the system is hardwired for the state and the minister concerned to keep control of that particular state asset and if the finance ministry or somebody else says, go privatize, the minister himself, and I'm not being specific of any one minister, will instigate the trade unions and rally support against that very decision. So, yes, it, 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 there is a, there, there, it's, it's an obvious solution. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can give you one, one classic example when it comes to the East Terminal. Okay, the, why don't you tell the, us the story? The yeah. East Terminal, there, there is enough and more data, enough and more em empirical evidence that under private management, because we have two terminals that are under private management, have produced better results, better financial results to the SLPA to the extent where more than a third of SLPA's net profits are generated from revenue streams that they get from the private operators. But still, 
we had a minister, we had a secretary, we had a chairman who advocated that the government should spend $450 million or $500 million in developing the East Terminal because the state had to own a deep water terminal. Absolute bullock. Because there's sufficient mathemat quantitative financial information that can be provided that a public-private partnership with the state, What's the point with the SLPA, that you're with, making? let me finish, with the SLPA yeah. owning a yeah. strategic stake of anywhere from 40 to 49% yeah. would provide far better results in terms of, so the point in terms is, of net financial yeah. benefits to the Ports yeah. Authority yeah. by undertaking a yeah. PPP. Are you, are you, you're just undergirding Ravi's point or Suresh's point that we must not let the state Correct. own things so, that So what I'm trying to say is that there may be instances where for certain strategic reasons, and I'm not a politician to yeah. answer why that is the case, yeah. that the government would not, not want to be seen to be, say, disposing of privatizing SLP mm. or whatever the case may yeah. be. But there are selected assets that are within some of these state enterprises that can be transferred to private management, just as much as Hambantota Port was transferred to private management, okay. and, and thereby the SLPA saving in the order of 70, 80 million dollars a year of debt service cost. So, so, so my assertion is that if you cannot divest or privatize the state entity concern, spin off whatever the unproductive assets within, within that state enterprise. I'll just say one, one point and, and stop. You will get another chance to speak. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> just to highlight yes. a point, the yeah. building material, okay. because I looked at this as, as a yeah. potential PPP, the building materials corporation is struggling to pay 600 million rupees of uh, debt right. because it doesn't have sufficient revenue. Yeah. Yeah. But it has 11 billion rupees worth of land. Okay, now uh, I think my panelists weren't fully introduced. I'm going to give a quick uh, sort of bio from memory uh, on them. I'll come back to Malati after that to respond to Tilan. Uh, uh, Tilan Vijay Singha was the, f was the first uh, chairman uh, of the Board of Investment, which is a new institution set up to attract foreign investment in Sri Lanka uh, in the 1990s. He was the founding pioneering chairman. Press, private sector chairman, okay, uh, or head of the organization, and has come back to lead uh, private public partnership uh, work for the government in Sri Lanka. Uh, Malati Knight uh, is a consultant researcher at Verite Research, uh, has a PhD in institutional economics, and is probably academically the most dis distinguished person in the panel. Ravi has been introduced, he's a fellow of Advocata, I'm not going to say more about you, Ravi. Uh, Suresh Shah is one of the leading lights of the private sector in Sri Lanka. He's been head of the Chamber of Commerce uh, and is a head of one of the, some of the major companies in the country as well. Uh, Malati, do you want to now add something? You heard Suresh, I'm going to question Suresh more later, uh, but you've heard Tilan coming in with uh, a variety of answers. Uh, do you want to respond to him in any way? We are talking about what is the solution if public ownership is the problem. Yeah, I just want to step back a little bit, and I think we're missing something here. We've said that public ownership is not good. And then we're trying to find a workable solution. But we seem to be, even if, okay, privatization were feasible, let's go with it. Uh, I'm caveat, I'm not averse to the P word. I worked with Anush for a long time. I was very gung-ho with privatization. But there are certain hard truths that we need to look, look at here. Um, privatizers, privatize, privatize, privatize is not going to guarantee success. If you look all over the world, the, the world is moving towards state capitalism. Is Malathi's mic getting picked up? Oh, right? Yeah, yeah, state okay. capitalism. And private ownership is not necessarily better than uh, public ownership. The similar principal agent problems accrue, uh, happen in both. Uh, if you look at the success stories all over the world, it's been about competition rather than about ownership, even telco, right? It was competition and contestability. It's not ownership. That's not the way, that's not the main problem. And if you look at telco as well, you look at privatization and private ownership, ownership. After telco, has that been replicated? Can it be replicated? What has happened in Sri Lanka so far? Uh, then you look just at the private sector, not privatized sector. You can't be, yeah, is there? Come, now? Okay. Yeah. Look at the private sector all over the world. Look at the global finance crisis, financial crisis. In Sri Lanka, the golden key crisis. So it's not that the private sector is free from crony capitalism, rent seeking. We have also two instances, my final point, two instances of major lapses in privatization. I think you know about them. 
Lanka Marine, the bunkering services, and Sri Lanka insurance. Those were overturned by the Supreme Court of this country, mainly because of undermining public interest objectives, rent-seeking, all of the above. So, um, like I said, we're missing this. We cannot confuse private ownership, private management. We need to look at what the problem really is. If the problem is management, tackle management, not ownership. So, you know, Malati's uh, comment about failed privatization reminds me of a, of a story that was told in Russia, post Glasnost on the streets of Russia. They said that, you know, people used to say that uh, there's the good news and the bad news. Uh, the good news is after Glasnost, we've realized that everything that the Americans said about the communist is true, and it was a great thing that Glasnost happened. The bad news is they realized that everything they said, uh, that the communists said about the Americans was also true, and the rapacious market was destroying the country. So there emerged then in the, in the, in the, in the rush to privatize, championed by one of my own professors, unfortunately at Harvard at that time, uh, the Russian oligarchs, okay? Uh, so so Mahmoud is raising Suresh and Ravi a process question, uh, which I'm sure you guys have thought about, uh, is that, uh, you know, how do you accept that, that, that criticism and, and I'm sure you have answers to that criticism that there is a problem that poor governments that do things poorly privatize poorly as well, which is what happens in, in Glasnost and so, so, so simply offering privatization as a solution may be entrenching some of the evils of, uh, you know, the poor government. Suresh, your mic is on your hands, yeah. Yeah, so poor governments privatizing poorly. But the yeah. thing is, poor governments will always run their state-owned enterprises poorly, guaranteed. Whereas even after poor privatizations, there would be some, at least, of those entities that would have reasonable resource allocation. I'm not saying good resource allocation, I'm saying reasonable. And those institutions would then do better than under state ownership. So the issue in, in a country like Sri Lanka and uh, in, in this part of the world, if I may say, is that poor governments are guaranteed to run their SOEs poorly. Whereas with the private sector, you at least have a chance. And Malati is absolutely right. Private sector is not perfect. Uh, but here we have a situation where, you know, it's guaranteed that under government ownership, it's never going to, it's not going to be good. Now, I want to address one thing that uh, Tilan said, and I think, uh, uh, you know, he, Tilan spoke about in our lifetime would some of these things happen and what, what the reality is. But that goes back to an issue of politics and of leadership. And that's, that's the sticking thing here. Um, you know, leadership is not about doing what the people want, but leadership is about shaping the outlook of people. That's what leadership is all about. You have a point of view and you uh, express that point of view and you have the ability to get people to follow you. Leaders are not at the back, leaders are at the front. People follow you, what you say, because you have a point of view. And it's about convincing the country right now and the Sri Lankan people, I'm speaking from a Sri Lankan context, that privatization, that that resources in private hands, let me put it that way, are much better utilized, are much better allocated than if they were in government hands. So I think that's the fundamental. To convince the country, that's where the leadership comes in, to convince the country that there is in fact a better way of running things. You know, think about it. If, uh, uh, again, the Sri Lankans here will know, uh, public transport, is in the hands of government. Do we get a good service? No. Uh, th think about any, any institution. Quality of goods and services produced? Do, uh, are you saying we get a good service from the private transport operators? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you do get good services from some of the private enterprises. <laughs> you no, I mean pu public transport. No, public transport, yeah. no. Um, but that's, you know, I get yeah. back to the point earlier. So let's say even 75% of the, of the private enterprises perform at least to 75% of expectation. Mm. 
it's always better than what you can get from uh, from a SOE. Okay, okay Suresh, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on this question of leadership. Uh, we are with the Atlas Network. Uh, it's a forum that believes in liberty, uh, freedom, and in, in to some extent that means democracy. Uh, so it's very easy, obviously, to do what you're saying if public uh, views didn't matter, we go ahead and privatize. But we are in a society where people seem to resist privatization. Politicians who say we shouldn't privatize are more popular and are more accepted. So if you are right, why aren't we winning the argument in the public space? Because the politicians who say that private enterprise is not the way to move forward have a better communication strategy than the other politicians. It's as simple as that. So it's, it's the ability to convince. So you, you, know, you, you go back to uh, the 1994, 95, 96 period, right? Uh, when uh, Mrs. Bandar and I, uh, when Mrs. Kumanatunga was elected president. She was elected president at a point when the country was ready for war. But if you remember, there was the Sudunendu movement which completely shifted the public view on the conflict. From uh, yesterday, she quoted these numbers when she came into power. The, amongst the Sinhala population, only something like 25% apparently supported a peaceful resolution to the conflict at the time. Within two to three years, that had shifted to something like 68%. So it, it can be done. And there are instances where it has been done. Uh, so, shifting public perception is, is possible and I think that's, that's where the attempt needs to start first. Okay, Ravi, do you have, I think I've seen you waiting to uh, respond to your yes, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, just, please uh, do, yeah. Yes. Uh, the, uh, as, uh, as both Malati and, uh, and Suresh pointed out, uh, the problem in, uh, with a closer. very corrupt government is that you will end up with a corrupt privatization. So, uh, so, the, which is what happened with both uh, uh, Sri Lanka Insurance and Lanka Marine Services. We also have a problem with government capacity. Uh, so, uh, the technical skills uh, to evaluate and do it properly are also a problem. So, there, are, there is one approach that I worked out uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which, uh, which I think is the only uh, realistic way forward, uh, which was again uh, listing, uh, uh, if you look at the success of the privatization before uh, 90, in the early 1990s, all of them uh, in included uh, a gift of about 10% of the equity free of charge to the employees. That brought a lot of employee buy-in. Uh, the second thing was that those uh, companies were all listed. Uh, which allowed wide shareholder participation uh, uh, in that, which brought about a lot of public support. Now, uh, in those instances, the formula was you sell 50% or, uh, or, or majority stake, 10% to employees, 10% uh, or 15% listed. Uh, uh, so uh, that worked at that uh, time with some reasonable success. Not everything worked properly, but there was some reasonable amount of success. In this case, I would say trying to sell majority stakes, uh, especially to a foreign investor, would be very negative. So therefore, what the approach to take is to simply broad base, give the employees a large chunk of shares, uh, maybe 15%, and list another 15% directly, uh, giving preference to small retail shareholders. Uh, so uh, you have the company, uh, sold not to a single large investor, but to the public themselves. Uh, uh, and you sell it at, uh, at a reasonable price so that uh, there's plenty of room for share appreciation. So, so the public as a whole benefit, the employees benefit, uh, and uh, uh, the process of listing means you have to produce quarterly accounts, you have to produce uh, uh, annual accounts, you have to follow the uh, uh, corporate uh, governance code of the stock exchange. If you're not, you get sanctioned. So that I would say would be uh, my uh, uh, formula for uh, uh, to balance the two sides and, uh, and, uh, and within these uh, conditions to try to take it forward. Yeah. and you have other ideas, but I want to keep you short 
Yeah, so I, 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 I think, Ravi, I, I agree with you that your approach is just one of several approaches that is required. It is, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a, it, it, it can be applied c through, through, through all state enterprises that we, that we look at uh, uh, divesting. Now, in the case of the state banks, that is what the government was proposing to do. List 15, 20 percent, give the, give the management uh, and, and, and the staff, I can't, be, I can't remember, it was a 5 or 10 percent stake, which worked out to, I believe, an average of several million rupees on average per employee. And it has been done in the past successfully. But it has also been done in, 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 in certain other instances where, where it has been done through, through private sales as well. So I'm not saying it's a panacea. Uh, where ought, all state enterprises should be privatized through the Colombo Stock Exchange, pr particularly at a time when the stock exchange is, is uh, you know, as, as pretty much uh, moribund or dormant as, as, as it is. Now, now in the case of um, the, uh, some of the privatizations of some of the uh, hotels that, that the PPP agency is looking at, we are looking at what is called a controlled auction system, which uh, allows the, which, which creates that, bidding process but not in the in the public domain like in the case of a stock exchange because in in, in today's era our financial advisors lazards out of uh, 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 Singapore have advised us that there will be many reputed parties who would not want to openly bid on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on, a, on an exchange but would certainly participate in a, in a private bidding process which is under supervision of a, a, a typically a cabinet appointed negotiating committee and a project committee with the advice of the private private parties you asked me about the PPP agency. One of the solutions I see to, to this is the PPP agency to have a separate arm apart from doing public-private partnerships in creating new assets, whether it's new power plants or new highways or what have you, to look at the, 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 the underperforming assets of existing state enterprises and dispose of those assets through new enterprises under a PPP structure. And, and that's something that I've been, I've been uh, advising the government and also re requesting that the public enterprise department of the treasury be work in collaboration with the PPP agency in, in moving, moving ahead with. One final comment, I agree fully on the power of communication. Uh, that, okay. that, and if something worked for Sri Lanka Telecom yeah. and that was communication. So let's explore this communication problem. Uh, and if many of you agree that private sector has a role to play in being part of the solution, for the mismanagement of enterprises by the state, uh, I think let's ask the question about why is the private sector so unpopular in Sri Lanka? Okay. Uh, I mean, I know, we all know the famous phrase by Adam Smith that said it's not by the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that we look to our dinner, but by their regard to their own self-interest. But in Sri Lanka, the private sector is regarded as so self-interested that the public interest is not adequately protected. So, in a sense, you have the, the competition against the incompetence of the public sector versus the immorality of the private sector. And in the public mind, they are happier to take the immorality, incompetence of the public sector than leave it to the immorality of the private sector. <laughs> Suresh, how do, you, how do you face that challenge as a leader in the private sector that must also talk about a more ethical private sector? If it is to win public confidence, what are we doing to make our private sector something that people can believe in and support politicians who, who support privatization? Nishana, I, you know, my personal belief is that in any society, you get a percentage of people, they could be private sector, they could be politicians, they could be anything, uh, who will break the rules and you can put whatever systems, controls, processes that you want, but those people who want to break the rules will break the rules. 90% of the people probably don't do that, and I think this is true even of the private sector. Uh, the issue with private enterprise is that to be sustainable, private enterprise needs to make profit. Um, now, for some reason in this country, people tend to believe that making profit is not a good thing. I don't know whether this goes back to, you know, the, the major religion in the country which says give up everything uh, and that's how you're going to attain nirvana. I, I, I don't know whether that's where it stems from. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, I believe that most of the corporates in the country 
uh, do act within the law, do want to build sustainable businesses, do want to be good corporate citizens, but they got to be ambitious uh, because to sustain businesses, to uh, last, uh, to be, to create lasting businesses, you do need to make profits and you do need to make cash flows. Uh, the thing here, from from a country's perspective, is you got to take this ambition of 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 the private enterprise of private business uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have governments that need to use. Uh, a private enterprise uh, as a tool to create development in the country, uh, to, in, uh, to improve the standards of living of the people by, you know, create jobs, for example. So when governments speak about giving, uh, uh, creating an environment that is conducive to investment, it's not to help the private sector, but it is with a greater sort of objective of creating employment and that employment creation can come only through invest uh, when private sec when the private sector invests so so on the one hand there is an objective of government on the other hand there is an objective of the private sector and smart governments tend to manage to bring both these objectives together so that so that they create a win win situation uh, use the amb uh, you know at the end of the day self interest is not not such a bad thing uh, the ambition is self interest each one of us wanting to do better for ourselves, that's self-interest. And that applies to, it applies to governments, it applies to corporates, it applies to everyone. And, you know, ambition yeah. is at the end of the day. So, um, I'm going to go to Malati and then Tilan. Malati, so Suresh seems to say there is self-interest and if you don't put a system around uh, of rules and, you know, a system that channels that self-interest into achieving the public interest, uh, you know, we are not going to succeed, but is the, what is the deficit in that regard? What kind of regulatory environment do we have? Do we need to have less regulation? Do we need to have different regulation? How do, what are the gaps in having private sector action work better in the public interest of the country? No, very short. Self-interest is not the problem. Lack of competition is the problem, even in the private sector. You see the private sector now barking at competition, various, at various sectors, that's one. Two, regulatory lapses. There are no solid regulatory institutions in this country, whether Microsoft. it's from utilities to the finance sector to, uh, co there doesn't exist a proper competition law. So many years of liberalization, and we are behind Pakistan or Nepal for God's sake. Okay. okay, Tilan, you wanted to come in on it, yeah. I'm not disagreeing with what has been said so far, but to answer your question, Nishan, which you posed initially about how to, how, how, how to build trust, one is obviously the process adopted for privatizations or PPPs. And wherever the process has gone wrong, either due to f f flawed RFPs, um, we've seen what, what, what has happened where privatizations have actually failed. But what people are failing to look at are the successes. Even though I, I, I still question about you know, some of the issues, but fundamentally Sri Lanka Telecom and some of the privatizations, about a dozen of them have been successful. So in, in, when the process itself fails, then the next aspect you have to look at is the risk allocation. We had a situation many years ago where Caltex uh, was selected as a partner to take over the lubricant business of the government and was given a 20-year monopoly or, or, or something along those lines which is absolutely ridiculous. So the risk allocation process is wrong. But in order to ensure the fairness and the enforcement element of it, apart from selecting the right PPP partner or the privatization partner, which is a sine qua non for there to be a, a building of trust and confidence, we've got to focus on the various agreements that co govern privatizations and PPPs. And if you were to conduct certain case studies of where PPPs and privatizations have gone right, it is because it was a, there was a well-negotiated agreement, whether it's a shareholder agreement, a concession agreement, lease agreement, etc., that governed the underlying asset that was passed on to the private sector. And wherever there was, there was sound agreements, things have worked. Wherever, and also, we must also agree that or, or look, look at, right at the outset, if those agreements, there are fundamental flaws, they need to be renegotiated, like what happened in the case of Port City, where there were certain fundamental flaws in that particular agreement relating to environmental issues. These were renegotiated, 
fresh EIAs were done, and, the, and, the, and, and, and you can see the sand field coming up. I'm not talking about buildings that are coming on there, I'm just talking about what happened sometime in 2015. Okay, I, uh, I'm going to just say that I'm going to go very quickly in a little bit after the next question. I'm going to go to the audience, uh, I, uh, and, and, but before that, uh, the organizers haven't given me an exact time to end because I know we started late. But I'm going to ask one last question from you guys um, before we come to the audience. We know that in Singapore, in China, in, even in the United States, there are state-owned enterprises that are very successful. Uh, so, is the solution really Suresh's solution uh, to privatize, privatize, privatize? Uh, or, I mean, uh, with then the additional layers of regulation, due process, disclosure, or is there a role for some industries, natural monopolies, uh, or I, whatever the type, uh, what do we learn from these countries where the state has run organizations well, and what, what justifies not having that ambition for Sri Lanka? Uh, I will let maybe whoever wants to make a comment on that, say one or two of you, and then go to the audience for their answers. Uh, Malati first, yeah. And maybe is it Ravi who wants to come back here? Yeah. So what comes to mind is China. Okay, China, state mm. capitalism. Now China has succeeded because of these state enterprises, right? Not in spite of it, it's succeeded because of this, it's doing really well. That doesn't mean it doesn't have its problems of nepotism and corruption and all of that. But again, it goes back to my previous point. It's not about private ownership and state ownership. It's about understanding a particular enterprise properly, completely, peeling off the layers. It's case specific, diagnosing the problem and then finding a case specific solution, whatever that might be. It could be performance contracting. It could be management contracting. It could be PPPs. It could be uh, incremental privatization but it requires careful diagnosis. Okay, so Ravi, last word before. Uh, okay. I think the one word is, okay, uh, sure. is governance and accountability. Yeah. Wherever it works, uh, Singapore has excellent governance, accountability, even uh, the Scandinavian. So if you have uh, uh, a good governance mechanisms, you're able to hold uh, 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 them to account, your agency costs, your political costs uh, are much lower, so then it can work. When you have extremely poor governance, uh, uh, it's uh, it's difficult. So so that's the that's the uh, route Problem. to uh, yeah. route to fix. Uh, without the governance, you can't expect uh, performance. Performance, okay. Uh, Nishan, very strong institutions with uh, with good quality people running them, and yes, then you have a chance. But having said that. I would still say government really has no business to be in business and the fundamental reason for that is government should not be owner, regulator and uh, Sorry? operator. And operator, yeah. Government should not play all those three roles. The minute the government is the owner, the regulator and the operator, you have a problem about uh, a level playing field across industry. So um, certain if there is an essential monopoly, then maybe the case is slightly different. But in general, I don't think government really has any business being in business. Super. So let me actually just give the chance to the audience. I know Anush had his hand up early, so I will take his question first. Uh, then I will come to this other gentleman in the uh, front row and the gentleman behind him uh, after that. So I've identified the first three. Uh, and then there's a lady there at the back. Um, I'm sorry that I don't know your names, but I think she was the one who uh, is the head of the, or chair of the Atlas Network probably. I forgot her designation, uh, but I will take her question forth. Okay, Anush, yours. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nishan. I'm going to gather about at least uh, maybe, yeah, one or two questions, but let's see how it goes here. Uh, three quick questions. The first is, uh, Suresh, you talked about uh, the lack of effective communication or leadership to shape people's opinions. Uh, uh, even in the absence of that, it's a puzzle for me why there hasn't been outrage among the public, very organic outrage among the public when they hear stories of abuse uh, of uh, resources in public institutions, 
loss, losses that then mean Resources. better uh, public services can't be delivered. So that's the first one. Why hasn't there been organic outrage among the public? The second is, uh, is there a low-hanging fruit? I know Nishan tried to get to that saying, okay, if privatization is at one end of the extreme, what, what are the things we can do now? And I was wondering whether you all had thoughts around board governance. In the private sector, the, the, uh, the board being empowered with good quality people and with the feet to their fire, they have to ask the right questions and that in turn helps the company behave better. Similarly, uh, is there something that can be done around make, making sure boards are independent and, and, and credible, even in state ownership? The third is I feel we're, dis not, we're, we're not seeing SOEs and all of the, the bloating that uh, Ravi talked about in the context of what has happened with wider economic policy and economic freedom issues. Essentially in Sri Lanka, state-owned business enterprises have been an unofficial unemployment insurance that has managed to absorb uh, unemployed workers in the absence of a dynamic private sector, which, and that has come at a cons as, a, as a consequence of government policy that has been an anti-private sector, anti-export bias. So uh, the question there is, uh, how can we connect those two, or rather why, why, why is it right to see that in this connect we're trying to solve the state-owned enterprise issue, but at the heart of it is an employment issue, giving jobs by politicians to folks who haven't got jobs in the private sector, but you're not dealing with why the private sector isn't growing in order to generate those jobs in the okay, first place. Okay, so place. I said I'll, I'll collect three questions. Anush asked all three. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to give you all a chance to reply in 30 seconds or less, one of the questions, and you all can pick any question you like. Uh, go. Anyway, the em yeah. employment one. Yeah. As long as politicians demonstrate to those who are unemployed that yes, there's a pot of gold awaiting in terms of a job in a state enterprise, you're going to have that pressure. But the moment the states, the, this is where I believe em empowerment of the finance minister is required. Because if you have a moratorium on employment, particularly at the bloated enterprises, still on petrol, let's take the big five, Petroleum Corporation, uh, Ports Authority, uh, the, the loss making enterprise, CEB, if, you, if there is a legally binding moratorium, you will find, um, Basically, the labor market is adjusting in a particular manner. So, it, what it takes is just, you know. So, this is the low hanging fruit. Then, the, what is the question you answered? The, the employment problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you're not solving the employment problem, you're just making sure the state doesn't solve it either. State needs to put a stop. Okay, to, okay. Uh, Fine. State needs no worries. Suresh, uh, 30 seconds. Yeah, and then Malati. Yeah. yeah, Anushka, I'll respond to your first one. Why no outrage? And I think the reason for that is people think that all this money is plucked out of trees or government can just print it. I don't think they really realize that the, the VAT component they pay when they buy a packet of biscuits, right, at the end of the day goes to fund a lot of these losses in SOE. So I don't think they make that connect. And it's not in the politician's interest to make the connect for the people either. So I think that's left to young guys like you to do. <laughs> okay, we want to ask why the Ceylon chambers haven't succeeded, but <laughs> Malati, yours. Anush, the board question. Yes, that's a very Malati, good Malati, you need to keep the mic much closer, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. The board question, I think that's a very good question. And I also, another low-hanging fruit, just like uh, there should be independent boards and all of that in the state sector. I don't see why the state sector should also not be subject to competition. Yeah. Why not? Subject to competition and the listing rules that listing Ravi rules. raised. I mean, Ravi, not? is there anything else you want to add? Very quickly though, but otherwise I'll go Sorry, to Sorry, one, one more low hanging yes. fruit. Okay. Board, the board question. At, at the moment what I'm finding is that boards are ineffective because A, the politicians appoint the boards and B, the finance ministry representative is absolutely useless as far as be, being an activist on the board. So I think the finance minister needs to become a shareholder activist. And what I'm proposing is on top of these loss-making state boards, put another layer of majority finance ministry officials in order to make sure that certain fiscal decisions cannot be taken by the boards in the sort of irresponsible manner that's been going on. But I, I'm, I'm call it an advisory board, call it something else. But I'm, I'm, I mean, honestly, looking at that as an as a interim fix for a major problem of ineffective boards. Super. Uh, this gentleman, if you can just also just say your name and... Uh, yeah. My name is Anura. I don't mean to uh, throw this discussion off balance. But if we want to find the solution, we have to identify the problem. And don't you think at the end of the day, 
that if you go back to the keynote speech, I think it addressed the situation fairly and squarely. Uh, what he brought out is that no matter what, the ministers and the MPs are behaving badly, right? And at the end of the day, even if we have a very good moral leader, all these ministers or the parliamentarians will bipartisanly unite to impeach somebody who is going to reprimand them. We have had this tradition and this being used as a last resort. And as a result, even the leaders have to tolerate a certain amount of bad behavior. Don't you think that that is the problem? And in that light, I'd like to applaud you for your suggestion. Why can't the state or the private sector rise to the occasion and have some sort of an alternative government type of situation? Yeah, so why can't the private sector do something different and new? We can't expect the government to pull itself out up by its bootstraps and fix the problem. Is what saying, Ravi, you want to have yes. a quick answer uh, and then yes. we'll continue to the gentleman uh, behind you. Yeah. Uh, the, the problem is in the wider political system, so it must start with constitutional reform, including campaign finance reform, uh, uh, plus uh, a lot of other things. Uh, I have a 4,000 word essay on constitutional reform, which you can read on the Advocata website. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to speak anymore, I think, on that. Yes, that's the difficulty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's a more fundamental question as to, you know, when we have the problem of the weak bureaucracy and the failing bureaucracy at Verite, we have this uh, kind of little phrase that some of my team came up with that says the bureaucracy suffers from bureaucracy. Uh, and in fact, the idea that politicians can solve the problem of politics He's, Anur is asking, are you, saying, are you asking politicians once again to solve the problem of politics? Uh, why can't, the, is there a solution outside of going to politicians to solve the problem? I don't think it has an answer now, but let's come back to it. Uh, the question behind here. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Razaullah. I'm from Pakistan, representing Alternate Solution Institute. Um, uh, actually, the discussion uh, here, uh, I just want to uh, uh, recall the situation of SUEs in Pakistan. In Pakistan, uh, you, uh, the defense budget is one of the largest pie in the uh, 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 budget. But uh, maybe it would be of interest that the losses incurred by SOEs is much more than the defense budget of Pakistan. For instance... Uh, is much more than the defense? Budget of Pakistan. The defense budget yes, of Pakistan. The, the losses incurred by I the I thought the SOEs. Pakistan defense establishment owns most of the SOEs also. Oh, yes, they have also, but yeah. uh, I'm not, I mean, counting those SUEs. Okay. So, uh, the situation in Pakistan, we can say that it is, uh, the, the last year, in the last four years, the, uh, the total losses is around $10 billion by the power sector only. So, you can imagine that how much we are in losses. So, the, the question is, that the, the fundamental question is that can the work of an SUEs be replicated or done by some private sector, sector or not? I mean, it is the matter of the utility, or we can say that on which uh, life cycle actually this SUE is. If it is, if an SUE is important for the society, or if it is uh, not done by any private sector, so we can say that SUEs can continue their work. If that work can be replicated, for instance, uh, here I I'm have. I'm going to. I'm going to cut you for to the next. Yes. 15 seconds, yeah. Okay. For instance, like I have seen there is an Ayurvedic uh, medicine authority. Yeah. So do you think that that can work cannot be done by some private person? If the rail or I mean some banking work cannot be replaced by some private sector? So I, I mean I have a very, uh, uh, my opinion is that there is no such question that SUE should continue in the private hand in the, in, with the government if it is not performed by some private sector. Yeah. Tell me your name again. Razaullah, Dr. Raza. Razaul. Yes. Yes, thank you. So let me take the question also from the, I think, is it the chairman of Atlas or the... Oh, thank you very much. My name is Linda Whetstone. I am chairman of Atlas. I'm yes, speaking in right. a distinctly private capacity. And thanks very much for letting us all join in this question. What I want to do is actually challenge the basis for your final round of questions. You said the private sector is dishonest. 
I think if we took a vote, we'd think there's some dishonesty in it. There's quite a lot of honesty in it. I don't disagree with that totally. Then you said the public sector is incompetent. I think we'd all agree the public sector is pretty incompetent. There may be some competence. But you did not say, and also dishonest. Anyone here, if we all asked, how on, is the public sector any more honest than the private sector, do we think? Is there no own agendas, no public choice going on there? I would say that the private sector may be dishonest, the public sector may be incompetent, and also is probably the most dishonest. Um, and I just think that we shouldn't think that the public sector is any more honest than the private sector, and I don't think we do, but I was sad that none of your fellow panelists challenged you on that. So thank you for that Let me, the question. That question was for me, I think. Um, uh, what I was phrasing was not my view of the op op opposition, but what we perceive to be the social response in Sri Lanka uh, to the problem of private versus public sector. If you read the Singular Press, uh, it is very clear that there's more trust in the public sector, however incompetent it is perceived to be, uh, than in the private sector where it is perceived. We are not agreeing with that perception in society. We are asking the private sector why they have not been able to change that perception uh, in a way to win public confidence and trust. Uh, the question on the power sector uh, and the medicine sector by Rizul, I think poses a unique kind of question because uh, the question is if the government ran power at a profit, somebody has to pay. And when the government runs power at a loss, it approximately means that they're subsidizing society. So this is not just about profit and loss, it is about allocation of benefit. Can, is the government in a better position to allocate welfare by running companies in a way that subsidizes the poor rather than allowing the private sector to run it and trying to redistribute through taxes. So is this a better way to redistribute? And pharmaceutical industry is very interesting. The, the government of Sri Lanka recently managed to reduce the price of essential drugs by almost half. Uh, and fortified drugs were reduced just by regulation. It is a totally private sector activity in which there was competition and yet drug prices were too high and India did the same and brought drastic r reductions in drugs. It seems competition didn't reduce prices in a way that were beneficial to people on an essential item. What's going on, Tilan, Suresh, Malati, what is the solution? We'll have Suresh start, yeah. Yeah, so, so what we're saying is Malati's problem, that competition doesn't seem to be delivering and ultimately, Allocating welfare is, is, a, is a role of government and does government allocate it better by sometimes owning the monopoly industries rather than giving them over? Uh, the thing, Nishan, is that at the end of the day, everybody pays. Okay. So you may have uh, a subsidy which is uh, identified with a particular sector, but th the entire population does have to pay for that in some form or the other. Uh, and there are ways in which this can be handled. So, for example, if you take even within Sri Lanka, the system is not perfect though. There is a subsidy on fertilizer. But the fertilizer is delivered to the farmers by the private sector and the government pays the, the private sector the component of the subsidy. So that's, that's probably a model that can, that can go across in the event you want to actually subsidize um, uh, a service for instance. Um, Having said that, then of course there is a wider question. Do you, you, know, do you place subsidies here, there and everywhere? Or do you have a different safety net, a different welfare system? Um, so, so then, you know, that's, that's of course yeah. uh, a much wider discussion than, than I guess that we can have here. But the point is that some, everybody actually pays at the end of the day. Of course, uh, which is precisely the issue. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else want to come in on that? I will go for one last round so of questions. Wait, wait, ten uh, maybe seconds, Tilan just and Ravi, do you want to say anything? Yeah. Just that, I mean, subsidies per se is not the issue. Is the inability for the owner of those enterprises, the finance minister, to understand are these subsidies being used to camouflage or, or hide 
waste and corruption in the areas that are, are profitably sold to yeah. consumers. So when you look at the CEB's PNL and their balance sheet, I cannot make head or tail of what portion of that is stemming from due to the pub uh, pub subsidy, same mm. with Petroleum Corporation. Mm. And so, so I, think, I think you have to fundamentally start with proper, proper accounting standards and find a way to reprimand the management or the board or whoever of those who don't, who don't, who don't, who don't, proper, who don't uh, follow transparent uh, financial disclosure. Thank you. Uh, can I have a show of hands for how many questions there are? I'm going to end with the last round of questions. Um, One gentleman has already asserted the floor. You have to wait till I call on you. Uh, but I will call on you. So there are one, two, three question hands that I see. If they can get mics in advance, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my question is regarding the disinterest that the public has about the losses of the state enterprises. And your name? I'm Shanal. I'm Shanal. Hi, Shanal. Yes. Uh, so like, Losses at state enterprises are essentially a waste of taxpayers' money. But as far as I know, a majority of Sri Lankans do not pay direct taxes, so they do not feel like a certain portion of my income, government is taking X amount from my income and wasting it. So do you think that that's a contributing factor for people to not care about the losses? You're right. Not paying taxes can make you not care about losses. That's great. Second question, yes. My name is Bert. Sanu De Silva. Uh, <clears throat> just want to make a few points. I actually talked to uh, Dilan before we started the meeting. Uh, I was the head of a company which was owned by the government but ran as a private company. This is about 20 years ago, which was subsequently uh, made went public. And I'm good to keep your question a little bit short, okay? Yeah. What I want to try yeah. say is I think the most important thing is the culture. Okay. and the leadership of the company, that whether it's a government-owned company or a private company. It is the leadership that makes a difference. Especially in the state-owned enterprises, the chairman and the board that is appointed also changes. That is another issue, that because after a couple of years when the government changes, uh, people change. So there's no continuity of the policies and the plans that the people adopt. So that is another reason for the failure of the state-owned enterprises. Right. So it is not necessarily that the state-owned enterprises will fail because of ownership. And in fact, there was a study that was done by University of Uppsala uh, of Sweden about 20 years ago on the state-owned enterprises in Sri Lanka. I think the, maybe the institute can get hold of that, which is very interesting. And they came out with the conclusion that it is not the ownership that matters, but it is the culture and the leadership. Okay, thank you very much. The third question over there. Is there anyone else with a question? Can I see a show of hands, but don't, I think this may be the last round, yes. Uh, my name is Manela, and my question is on um, using existing mechanisms to fix this, uh, SOEs and their performance. I think there's a good tool introduced by, uh, a tripartite uh, tool introduced by the IMF, Ministry of Finance, and the Line Ministry, so Statement of Corporate Intents. I don't think that this has got the sufficient, um, this hasn't really got a lot of uh, attention, nor pub publicity around it. But my question is, how can we use SCIs to um, sort of improve the performance of SOEs in the current context? So what are the ways in which improvements can be made? Not really, but using SCIs, how can we use the statement of corporate intent, this particular tool that is already there, how can we use this instead of reinventing the wheel again? Okay, so I'm going to kind of um, focus those questions into, uh, why don't Malati answer that just, first and um, then we'll... The yeah. SCI is essentially a performance contract. Okay, so through that you can get to independence, you can hold the wages uh, and bonuses are tied to the performance of particular uh, individuals, all of that. So there is no, I mean, there's nothing stopping it being rolled out to all the SOEs. In fact, way before, I think in the early 90s, it was done in the Leather Corporation, Ceramic Corporation, and a few others. Do you remember that? Uh, way back, and a few others. It was in the Ministry of Industries and then it just died. But it's there, the information that it was done and all of that. Governments changed and it, cha and it was taken out. But that's a really good, uh, as Anush says, low-hanging fruit, as it were, to roll out. Okay, so I think um, if I were to focus the first question, it was on taxpayers and the fact that people don't pay taxes uh, and therefore they're not interested. But if the general issue really, I think, is what we've discussed, 
why are people not more interested in this absolutely important change that you seem to be talking about. So I'm going to give each of you a chance to close now by answering two questions. One is, why is the public not more interested if there is such great benefit? The second question is, is ownership really the problem with regard to state-owned enterprises? Or is there another way in which we should be pursuing solutions and other ways? Are they interim? Uh, or are they, uh, should we be only looking at changing ownership? Or what is it that we are really looking to change? And how do we go about it? So you can reflect on it. I'm going to give Ravi the last word as a host from Advocata. But maybe uh, Tilan, uh, Suresh, Malathi, and then Ravi. Okay, and we're going to end with that. Answer those two okay. questions. Um, uh, is ownership the critical crux of the problem? Why is the society not more interested? Ownership is not uh, the crux of the problem. It's a problem of governance. And that's why I'm looking at it potentially as a low-hanging fruit as to how we can make these boards more effective by virtue of the, the beneficial loan and the finance ministry becoming more of an activist and giving greater leadership than what it has been doing the last decade or two decades or whatever the time period. So therefore, in order to address the second question of sensitizing, I think there needs to be greater level of activism, not just by the finance ministry, it's just primarily important, but civil society. Uh, the power of analysis cannot be excluded. I mean, I, 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 I mean there is, if you look at the PPP agency, we've been somewhat of an activist within the finance ministry of, in fact, stymieing and, and blocking what we consider to be unfavorable fiscal transactions that there's greater propensity for line ministers to push through. So, so I, I think there's a, there's a greater role also to be played by institutes like Advocata in civil society by disseminating the impact of these loss-making SOEs and the waste that is going on in a more understandable, consumer-friendly manner. And I, I, I believe that, that, that there will be a, a greater public pressure to solve these issues. I mean, I can just, I'll just say this and stop. The best case points would be the disasters that's going on in, 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 in the form of our inability to solve the problem at Sri Lanka Cricket and Sri Lankan Airlines. Mm. <laughs> There's a relationship between the two, you're saying. Thank you, yes. <laughs> um, in, in terms of your question, uh, you know, like I tried to explain to Anush, I think the Sri Lankan people believe that government gets money from trees or they can just print it or something like this. So, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter to me whether the SOE makes a loss or not. So I, that to me, I think, is a fundamental issue. Um, in terms of the other issue about ownership, uh, from a very philosophical perspective, if I may say so, I am a very strong believer that government should not be in the business of business. I think governments have much, much larger things to deal with and they should not focus their energies in terms of running uh, supermarkets or airlines or whatever it may be. Um, having said that, uh, and, and in a country like Sri Lanka, um, it's not so much the ownership but it is more the, uh, it, it is what Tilan said, it is governance, but governance l linked to the political culture that we have in our country. And unless you can fix the political culture, you're not going to get good governance. And I don't see the political culture, unfortunately, getting fixed in the short to medium term. Um, and under those circumstances, and also going back to my, you know, whole philosophical thinking, um, I think the, the, the long-term solution to SOEs in this country is to privatize. Thank you, Suresh. Malati, yeah. uh, Ownership is not the problem. The problem is uh, management, lack of sound regulatory governance, and lack of competition. And when it comes to people not being blah or not being really interested in what's happening in the SOE sector and the losses, I think we are all largely responsible, Nishan, the think tank community, because we have a huge role to play uh, in making these things visible. 
explaining this to people. Okay, so I don't pay my taxes, so I shouldn't be liable, I shouldn't be, that's not the, I mean, if actually, it's an informational asymmetry problem here. If people don't know, they, they don't have the information, they're not going to act. So that's up to us. It's in the public interest. Okay, Ravi, for the last yeah. word, yeah. Uh, but I'm going to I wrap think, up here. Yeah. Yes, uh, everybody pays tax, but nobody realizes it. Uh, because 80% of our tax revenue is indirect, uh, they don't realize that the high cost of living is a combination of either protective taxes that create rents or uh, uh, revenue raising taxes that the government uh, proceeds to take and uh, uh, misspend in various ways. So I think you need to bring that connection in. The second is uh, to go back to our original exercise, trying to map out and trying to track the full impact of what these, uh, uh, what the cost of these uh, things are. That will, I think, uh, if you can raise enough public outcry, perhaps you can uh, uh, try to bring in, uh, uh, make them realize that uh, this is really costing you and, uh, uh, and in ways that you don't really uh, uh, realize. You know, substandard pharmaceuticals getting into the market is, uh, is not just a question of, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it can, um, uh, it can have many other consequences. Thank you very much. So I think uh, just in wrapping up and not saying too much, uh, my panelists don't all agree about whether ownership is a solution or not. Uh, but at least three things they seem to agree, which I, I think, or the main thing is they agree that government is dysfunctional. Uh, I think there is a view that sometimes the competitive market environment is also dysfunctional. Uh, in Sri Lanka, which is the difference in ownership. But all of them seem to agree that if, you're to, if the country is to change, then society must ask for that change. Uh, and if society is to change, that advocata is part of the solution. Yes. Thank you very much. Let's give them a hand. Yeah.